Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2013 with another Watchman video broadcast. This is, this is a sub-series of the sub-series of the series that we have been doing. We've been dealing with the fourth kingdom. Let me go to the scripture, kind of bring you up to speed on what we're talking about. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He dreamed of four kingdoms that were going to come on the earth. His kingdom was already there, the kingdom of, he saw this image. And it was an image that was made of gold at the top, the chest was silver, the legs were brass, the feet were iron, but then the toes were part iron and part clay. So we spent a lot of time just breaking down the symbolism of that and trying to get some understanding of that. Uh, King in on this number four. Uh, we'll do that same thing again today. But he mentions the fourth kingdom. That is a kingdom that is in the future. It is going to come on the earth. So he says in verse 40, Daniel chapter 2, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Then in verse 41, And there whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, there's some ideas here, some symbols here. Think of, think of what's made of clay. Human beings are. And the Bible teaches that plainly. And so does Daniel too. And part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided... Think about what Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot, what? Stand. Right now, this image is standing. But because this fourth kingdom is going to be divided against itself, iron and clay, that doesn't work. And it's in the toes. That's what makes, that's what makes a man stand, is the strength and the power of his ten toes. God designed it that way. When those toes are taken away or when those toes are destroyed, that image falls. God, God's pretty smart. God is pretty smart. He knows how to destroy his enemies. Um, whereas thou sawest, verse 41, thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Then verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. Notice the opposites here. Iron and clay. Iron is hard, unmovable, unbendable. Clay, do anything you want to with it. Play-Doh. You can even eat Play-Doh. You can't eat iron though. So anyway, notice the opposites here. Partly strong, partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. They, whoever they are, Leonard Sweet and Joe Smith, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, literally man's DNA. That's what the Bible's telling you. Um, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so we're, we've been dealing with the fourth kingdom. We went from there to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice the four here, and that matches the four. So what is this fourth kingdom in Daniel? It is a kingdom of spirits, not flesh and blood. Flesh and blood kingdoms come and go. If it's based upon a human leader, you can kill him, and it's over with. But with Alexander the Great, 32, 32 years old when he died, that's not very long. And as soon as he died, his kingdom was over with. Got all busted up and divided and everything like that. But in this case here, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities. So we, we had a sub-series uh, dealing with principalities. And then we were moving on to powers. And I talked about like the power of the grave. And there's other powers yet that we're going to get into. There was a verse that I had in my notes. I spent one day just making notes on what the Bible says has power in it. We know that the Word of God has, has great power. It is the greatest of all powers. This Bible, tremendously strong. So I was making notes on what else in the Bible had powers. And I found this verse in Isaiah 47, and I wrote it down in my notes. And um, I was kind of wondering, where am I going to put that one? I'm just going to, maybe I can stick that over here. Maybe I can talk about it for a minute and then move on. I came in to um, our top secret broadcasting bunker last week, sat down, looked at that verse, and the Holy Ghost just hit me with it. 
And I realized then that there was, a, there was a teaching here that I think needed to be taught. There are some things going on right now, as with everything else that we look at, that that fourth kingdom is being worked on right now. How soon is it going to come? I don't know the answer to that. I know that God has it in store for us in the scriptures. I don't know when that's going to be. But I can clearly see that God is bringing this thing about right now. Yes, I said God. Because even if you have principalities and powers, and God is far above all principalities and powers. God is going to bring this thing about. And that's something that you never forget. I know some teachers, like of the charismatic word faith, they'll tell you, oh, God can't do anything unless you release him. I want you to think about that and show me in the Bible where God's like locked up somewhere. I do know of a God that is locked up and he really wants out of there. He wants to be released, but that's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when I saw this verse... I knew and realized then that I, I wanted to do the research. Some of it I had already done. I'd started seeing things here a long time ago and had been collecting notes on this and thinking, you know, that's going to make a good video one of these days. Have you ever heard of the divine spark? Have you ever heard of that? If you have, if you haven't, I'm going to tell you what it is. If you've heard of it and, and wasn't sure what it was, you say, well, I've heard that's from Gnosticism and things like that. Yeah, you're right. I didn't know that the idea of a divine spark was actually in the King James Bible, and I'm going to show it to you. So we're going to be dealing with what the Bible refers to as the power of the flame. Now, I want to do something this morning. This has been on my heart for the last two days, and I can't, I can't escape it. First Peter uh, is one of my favorite places to run to in the scriptures. I love 1 Peter. I love the, the hope and the joy that the scriptures give. But there's a couple verses out of here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run by you real quick. And I want you to ponder these as we, as we explore this idea of this flame and what it represents. Peter tells us in verse 6, chapter 1, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Many temptations folding over you. That's literally what that means. And all of that has a purpose. Remember, God is always in charge. So he says in verse 7 that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I believe that you and I are awaiting the appearing, Peter says here, 1 Peter uh, 1, 7, Colossians, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that you and I, he's going to appear in the clouds. He's going to appear in the sky. You and I are waiting for that, looking forward to it. But he mentions here that a trial of our faith a fire, a trial by fire is coming. He says it again in, uh, over in chapter 4. He says, verse 12, the first time I read this many years ago, I just sat back and I went, wow. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, that's his appearing, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. All through the read first Peter. Read it. You, you can shut the video off now. Go read first Peter and then come back. And we're going to explore what the Bible refers to as the power of the flame. It's going to take me a little while to move through all of this information. And I'm going to show you at the end how this directly affects you and I in preparation for the return, 
the glorious appearing, our being caught up together with them uh, to meet the Lord in the air, how I, I believe, according to the Scripture, that before you and I go, there is a fiery trial that is going to try us. And you know what? If your faith is established on the Word of God and they put your faith on trial, you have nothing to worry about. It's sort of like an innocent man taking the witness stand in his own defense. If he didn't do it, he has nothing to do but to tell the truth and he has nothing to be afraid of because his faith is grounded and settled in the Word of God. That's the hope that I want to give you in this sub-series, the divine spark, the trial by fire, of the sub-series, Principalities, Powers, Rulers of Darkness, Spiritual Wickedness, and High Places, of the series of the Fourth Kingdom. I told you I'd explain it, all right? Uh, and so anyway, let's get into the scriptures. Let's, let's, I'm going to show you the verse that, that really hit me and what led, to this, uh, what led to this teaching. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. I want you to look at the words of the scripture. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from, here it is, the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at nor fire to sit before it. Now, what, what had got me in my notes was uh, at, at some point in the future, I'm going to be dealing with the, um, in, in our series, Principalities, Powers, Rulers of Darkness, Rulers of the Darkness of this World, and that applies to astrology, uh, monthly prognosticating, stargazers. That's what he mentioned here, and so I had that in my notes, and I dealt with that a little bit when we were looking at principalities and stars, how they, uh, they're rulers of the darkness of the night, and they were created on day four. That's our connection there. But when I saw this verse after it, that's what really jumped out at me because he's telling everybody, if you want to go, if you want to go trust in this stuff over here, which is nothing but new age junk, this stuff is leading people in various ways to the fourth kingdom, the mark of the beast. They're plugging right along toward it. Even these new Bibles with the uh, Triketra mark of the beast symbol. No, I don't know if that's going to be the mark of the beast, but I know what that symbol represents. It represents the two strands of DNA and something added to it. That's what it represents. Um, and we're going to talk more about those symbols here in a little bit. But all this stuff is leading toward the fourth kingdom. And God says, you will not, you follow this, you will not be able to be delivered. You won't be able to deliver yourself from the power of the flame. The power of the flame. It's going to overtake all of these people. God says to us, you get grounded, rooted, settled in the Word of God, and your faith is strong in this book. God says there's going to be a fiery trial that's going to overcome you. But it won't hurt you. It won't kill you. Has that ever happened before? Has there ever been anybody in the whole Bible that actually was in fire and it never hurt them? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego... And they had the fourth with them, the Son of God. Or excuse me, as the NIV says, a son of the gods. That's not the right one. It's not the right, not the right Messiah, not the right Jesus. This Bible's got it right. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego endured, endured a fiery trial because they had the fourth with them. And so while the power of the flame overtakes and overcomes these, the trial by fire, all it does... It's just burn off the old chaff that's on our bodies and we get new bodies. I love that. Let's, let's look some more at what the Bible's saying. Joel chapter 2. In fact, let me, let me go back. Let me go back because there's a comparison here. In verse 14, Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. So there's a, it's a devouring fire. It's going to consume them. When you look in Joel chapter 2, remember Joel... Um, Joel points to Revelation 9 and these devils, these locust scorpions that are flying up out of where? Hell fire. Because when the pits open, this massive amount of smoke comes boiling out of 
this furnace, get it? The fiery furnace that these devils are in. So look at Joel chapter 2 and look at how Joel describes this advancing army. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth, look at that word there, the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. When I go back to Isaiah chapter 47, he said that all the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, the astrologers, and all those that follow them, they're going to be a stubble. What's going to happen? Joel chapter 2, this army is going to rise up, and, and it is, they have the, the sound of a flame of fire. They have the appearance, there's a fire that devours before them and a flame that comes behind them, and they're going to devour all of the stubble. So, I believe that this book is right. I believe all the words there were placed in there by God himself. It is the word of God. So what I did was, I'm going to kind of step aside here from this idea of, of flames and fires. Well, let's study what stubble is, what it represents. There's symbols all throughout the Bible, but the Bible describes what the symbols represent. So if you see stubble, we don't have to go into ancient archaeology and the esteemed lecturers and scholars at the university who say, yes, we've examined ancient texts, and they use the word stubble to describe such and such and blah, blah. Who cares? How do we know they're even right? I trust the book. So let's study what stubble is in the Word of God, Exodus 15:7. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Job 21, 17. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? All right, stop right here. I got to go back and, and tell you, Exodus 15 is the, uh, the song that Moses and the Israelites sang after Pharaoh and his army get drowned in the sea. All right, do you like that sound effect? Okay. So anyway, and he, he referred to them as stubble, Pharaoh and his army. That's Joel. They Remember, they have chariots and horses. That is Joel's army. That is, that's Todd Bentley. Todd Bentley goes around telling everybody, oh, the fire of the Lord, fire, everybody's on fire, fire. Doesn't anybody go, wait a minute, I don't want to be on fire. Okay. But anyway, that's what he's talking about. That's Pharaoh's army. That's Joel's army. That's the army. It is an army of the Lord. It really is. But God is using them to destroy mankind. See, God's one, God's one who established this fourth kingdom. Okay? And he's going to bring it down. Why? It's a form of judgment to, to both mankind and fallen evil angels. But then he says, Job 21, how often is the candle of the wicked put out? Think about this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You remember that? You remember how Jesus referred to the, um, the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation? Candles. You remember what he said? He said, and I don't remember which one. I'm just trying to operate from memory here. But he told one of the churches, if you don't knock it out and straighten up, I'm going to take your candle out. That's what I'm going to do. A candle. Babylon. Babylon no longer has the light of the candle. You know what the light of the candle is? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, let's, let's deal with old Leonard Sweet here because I'm going to talk about him. He says, he mentions fire in this book, Quantum Spirituality. Where do you see how he mentions it? Leonard Sweet claims to be a Christian. What's his claim? His buddy, Rick Warren, there's that picture of him and Leonard Sweet, I've used it before, Rick Warren and Leonard Sweet talking about how they're going to change the church. We're going to bring people into the kingdom of God. So they're buddies working together. Poor Leonard, what he's done is he's abandoned the light and the lamp of his path, the scriptures, the word of God. 
and he's exchanged it for these new age thoughts and these new age philosophies. The candle of the wicked just got put out because he won't follow the scriptures. So he leans to his own understanding and to other things, and that's what this is talking about. So back in Job 21, how oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. They, those who have let the candle go out, and they don't have the light anymore, the light of the Word of God. God says they're stubble. Psalm 83, 1. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. That's a conspiracy, by the way. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. And then it says in verse 12, this is all the same chapter here. Verse 12, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. Oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. I want to, we're going we're gonna to talk about this for a while, because these verses are precisely what's going on right now. Keep, thou, keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still. Oh, wow. Here we go. Most of these, you know what's creeping into the church now? It's a thing called contemplative prayer, whispering prayer, the Jesus prayer, Lectio Divina, Ignatian contemplation, whatever. It's not the Bible. Well, you say, well, meditate, meditate. Yeah, the Bible, when the Bible talks about meditate, it says, think on these things. Think about them. Think. Run them verses through your mind and think about them. Think about them. Think about them. Their version of meditation is don't think on nothing. Take everything out of your brain. Empty it completely out. Meditate that way. And here's what's going to happen. It's called uh, whispering prayers, which is interesting because you're supposed to be able to hear this God on the inside of you whispering to you. Do you know the Bible says that familiar spirits are the ones that whisper? Okay. So anyway, you have this God on the inside of you, and these, these writers about contemplative prayer, they all say the same thing, that God in his most profound form is often found in silence. And yet David said, please God, don't be silent to me. Say something. Speak your words to me so that I can have life. Okay? He said, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. You know who the hidden ones are? We are hid in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. Psalm 91 says that we are hiding and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. His wings are covering us. Oh, you say, oh Pastor, got you there. God doesn't have wings. Really? Then what was that that landed on Jesus' shoulder when he was baptized? It's the Holy Spirit. He has wings. Okay, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So they are th these people here are counseling with one another and consulting with familiar spirits how they can ruin the hidden ones and destroy them. Those who are truly born again, hid in Christ Jesus, like Noah is hid in the ark. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's what that looks like. And these are taking crafty counsel against those who follow this book. Those of you who follow this book, you know for a fact that that's what they do. They take crafty counsel against those who are hidden. They said, come let us cut them off from being a nation. We are a Christian nation. We are the generation of God. The name of Israel will be no more in remembrance. And then, then in verse 12, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. The Mormons, when they come to your door, they don't care that you go to First Baptist Church. They don't care. In fact, you're, one, you're the target because you know or at least pretend to know the faith of Jesus Christ. 
and they know that nine times out of ten they can come to you, sit down, talk to you, and wrap your head around their stuff, and they've got you. The Jehovah's Witness, the same thing. I used to work for a lady who was a Baptist Sunday school teacher for 20 years converted to Jehovah's Witness. They meet, and I'm not just talking about the Book of Mormons and the J-Dubs and everybody else. I'm talking about the New Age. I'm talking about the new Bibles that are coming in. I'm talking about A Course in Miracles. They have it as their goal to take the houses of God in possession. You know what the house of God literally... Now, there, there are two types of this. Number one, there is the, the gathering place of the people, which the scriptures refer to as the church. How about you, you, the Bible talks about how we need to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. The house of God would be the meeting place of God's people. But also, look at this. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The house of God is this, the human body. Remember, when we're talking about all of this in the context of Daniel 2, remember that the end game is that they mingle themselves with the seed of men. They come into the house of God and take possession of it. That's what's being said right here. And then David cries out, God, make them as the stubble and let the flames and the fires catch them on fire. He actually mentions the flame that setteth the mountains on fire. And you say, yeah, that, uh, you know, that metaphorical speech in the Bible, you know, that's really cool, to, you know. But we know that mountains don't really catch on fire. Well, there's a picture of one there. Okay, that's a mountain on fire. That's probably Southern California or something like that. Um, um, volcanoes? Volcanoes. What are they? Mountains on fire. Where does the fire come from? Do the geologists light it like a fuse of dynamite? No. Where does the fire come from? Where all the fire is. And he sets the mountains on fire because of the fire underneath them, consuming them. You see, just trust the words of this book and say to God, God, I believe it. Now, teach it to me. And I promise you, you'll see things. Now, I, I want to show you this little picture here. And I want you to kind of get this. This is actually called a fire pyramid. Anybody, I love camping. I love to go camping. And there's a way to make a fire. I have a fire pit out and I'm on my patio. I like to go out every now and then, cool nights, and light a big, nice fire. And I know that if you take that wood and lay it down flat, you're going to have a tough time getting the fire going. You put the wood sort of like that and light the fire and it just and by the way that's what fire looks like you know it starts out wide here and it's attached to like the coals of the wood it always starts down here flames always come from here and rise up and why am I showing you all this now like a mountain being on fire there's something I want to show you a little bit I've dealt with this idea before of what a pyramid is where do you see it in the context of this notion of the power of the flame or the divine spark? Isaiah 5.11 Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine, look at the words here, inflame them. Now, we've studied this many times before and I didn't want to bog the whole teaching down with this idea, but wine and strong drink in the Bible are figures of, uh, of another spirit, another Jesus, another gospel. They're, they're indicative of false doctrine. Um, the Bible says that God prescribed for the priest not to drink wine nor strong drink. Why? So they'd be able to know the difference between a clean animal and an unclean animal. If you're drunk, you don't understand the difference. You're going to throw an unclean animal on the altar and sacrifice it. And God tells us over and over in the scriptures, wine and strong drink, through strong drink, Isaiah 28, they are out of the way. What is the way? It's the word of God. Babylon has a cup in her hand full of the wine of her filthiness, and she pours it out and she makes people drunk with it. And God ordains it to be so, because God said, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Why? Because there are people who don't want to know the truth. They don't want to know. 
They reject the Bible. They reject the King James Bible. And they say, oh, I like these newer translations because it, it, it says, number one, it says what I want to hear. Number two, it's just, it's easier for me to read, which most of them don't read it anyway. And then the preachers put four or five different translations up on the screen and teach false doctrine. That is wine. It makes people drunk. And you know what God said? Wine inflames people. And, you know, just think about the reality of that. Wine, like whiskey and vodka and Jägermeister and all this stuff, Everclear, what does it have in it? What's the key ingredient? Alcohol burns. Okay? You cannot throw whiskey on a fire and put it out. But you can, you can keep one going with it and just think about the reality of the Word of God. Wine is going to inflame them. The, the injection of all these false doctrines is the wine that is part. And I want you to think of this idea of doctrine. This book is meant to teach people false doctrine. Morals and Dogma, Book of Mormon, The Book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, Dan Brown. These, all these books are meant to use words to give people wine of a false spirit that eventually is going to inflame them. You're going to see the connection as we move on. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. See the opposites? That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. You see, you see let me stop right here. You see, what it, you see how the Bible uses those terms. Wine is strong drink. And what happens is when you are drunk with these false doctrines, you call what's good evil. And you call that which is evil good. And, and it came through a spirit of wine and strong drink. So verse 23, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. You see, it's right there. Wine, strong drink, what happened? They decided to walk away from the pure Word of God and exchange it for Bibles to where they can say, now there's mistakes in all the translations. Let me tell you what I really want you to know. I, I did a study of the Hebrew and Greek, and the Hebrew and Greek says blah, 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 and that's what they're giving everybody. They're not giving them the pure Word of God. They despised it. And if you, and, and some of you know this, You've heard these guys talk about, number one, the King James Bible. Number two, you've heard them talk about the King James only people. And let me tell you, I know this so much because I used to be over here. I used to be. I was going to have all kinds of trans. I was going to be one of them Bible on the screen. Pre well, I still kind of am, but just the King James. But I was going to put all those translations. I was going to do what Rick Warren was doing. I was going to do what Bill Hybels was doing because I wanted me a mega church. I wanted me a lot of money. That's what I was going to do. And I had been taught in the seminary, in the Bible college, that there was mistakes in all the Bible, so you can't really trust them. And I remember going. The Free Will Baptist had a meeting in Charleston, North... Where was it? It's in North Carolina somewhere. Okay? Went to a meeting there, big national convention. And there was a debate on the King James only issue in the Free Will Baptist. And I went representing these guys over here. And I saw these men stand up with tears in their eyes trying to defend the Word of God. And I was just going, <laughs> You guys. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're so silly and cheap. Oh my goodness. I despised King James men. I hated you guys. I'm like Saul on the road to Damascus because I was going to make it a point to destroy the King James Bible and, and, and ridicule those people who stood by it. 
and God got me. Now I'm one of them. And I know how they talk. I know how they talk about us in their, in their meetings, in their preacher meetings. I know how they ridicule us and ridicule that book. I know this because I used to be there. I used to do that. And I've apologized to God many times. I've apologized to preacher friends that I have in the ministry. And I just want to say to you, those of you who are still standing, thank you. Thank you that when a guy like me came around and God brought me to it, there were some men who never walked away that was still there that took me in to be your friends. It means a lot to me. It really does. <clears throat> but I know, I know what they talk. They, they despise it. They hate it. You know why? They're full of wine. Full of strong drink. They have another spirit. And what God's going to do is God's going to see, he says they're like stubble. And what's going to happen is the Joel's army is going to come out and it's going to overtake them. Just like flame overtakes a field of stubble. And nothing would be able to stop it. You know, you talk to anybody that's in firefighting, they'll tell you when they pull up on a house, they, they can pretty much contain it if they get to it in time. If they get to a brush fire or a little forest fire, it takes them days, days to put it out because it just widespread the wind and everything like that. It's one of the hardest fires to fight. And so just keep that in mind. Those who are despising the Word of God, the true, inerrant Word of God. And by the way, that's the definition of the Word of God. It is always inerrant. Never, never a mistake in it. If it has a mistake in it, it is not the Word of God. It can't be because God doesn't speak mistakes. God doesn't let His Word rot in the ground. He doesn't. He preserves it. Anyway, moving on. Isaiah 33, 11. You shall conceive chaff. Notice now we have like birthing words. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime. As thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Thorns? That's a picture of sin, isn't it? That's the curse, isn't it? And so, they're going to conceive chaff and bring forth stubble. The breath. You know what breath is? It's the spirit. Your breath, your spirit as fire shall devour you. So when they start talking about that little flame that you got on the inside of you, think about it. That's what's it. You want that to come out? It's going to devour you if it does. I'm I promise you this is what the Bible is telling you. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 18. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. They shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Have you ever heard in the last few years the word kindle? And I'm saying that and automatically my mind is jumping to a product. You probably already know where I'm going with this. We're going there. But I want you to notice this. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for stubble. You know why? God hated Esau, but he loved Jacob. They represent two nations. Jacob trusts in the word of God and has the birthright. Esau despises the birthright, and it's Two different people, two different groups. They call everybody who talks about Jesus and the cross, they call everybody Christians. The problem is there are some who are and some who aren't. I'm not anybody's judge. But what I'm telling you, there are clearly two different types of people. And the Esau people who despise the birthright and despise the law of the Lord, they are as stubble. And there's going to be a kindling of that fire. In fact, that kindling is taking place right now. Nahum chapter 1 verse 9. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time, for they shall be folded together as thorns. And while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. 
I could spend a lot of time right here in these verses. Let me run it down very quickly. Number one, you see the thorns. Number two, you see the drunkenness. They always go together. Thorns represent the curse of sin. Thorns are a picture of the Antichrist. A messenger of Satan. That's what Paul called his thorn, a messenger of Satan. Literally an angel of Satan. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Thorns represent the kingdom of the Antichrist. Drunkenness represents the spirit that's part of that. And God says they're going to be devoured as stubble, fully dry. And he said, there's one come out of thee. Where is he? He's in thee. He is going to come out of thee. You say, oh, that doesn't really mean that. Really? But that's what it says. And I just believe what the Bible says. He's imagining evil. So you hear all these, you hear all these Rick Warren Leonard Sweet people, and all these people that have abandoned the King James, talking about let's reimagine church. Let's reimagine God. Let's, as part of our worship service, let's imagine. Let's have a new, fresh imagination of God. Let's intuit God. Let's feel God. That's what they, because they've rejected and despised the word of God. So there's one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. See, that is the opposite of the wonderful counselor. It's referring to the Antichrist. So you see the connection here. Thorns, stubble, wine, strong drink, the Antichrist. He's the flame. He's that divine spark that's in you. We'll see it as we move on. Malachi 4.1 For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. See, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day cometh, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Let me just look at this verse. I know I've spent a lot of time on these verses, but I think it's important to lay the foundation down. The day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Think of an oven, a furnace. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think of when the pit is open and smoke as of, as of out of a great furnace. That day is going to burn as an oven. And all they that do wickedly shall be. So we're learning who stubble is. We're learning what uh, the Joel's army, what it is they're going to destroy. They're going to destroy all this. God's going to raise them up. God's going to let the fire come out of the pit. Literally, he's going to unleash hell. But remember something. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against thee. Think of Samson. When the Philistines had him enclosed, and they had taken the iron gates and had locked them, and Samson just went to the iron gates and he went, oh, it's locked. <laughs> he picked them off. They came off of the stone casing they were on and put them on his shoulders and walked up on top of a hill. Think of Christ bearing the burdens to Calvary, the hill. The gates of the Philistines did not prevail against Samson. You know why? His seven locks. You know what the seven locks were? Seven spirits of God. The word purified seven times in a furnace of earth. There is a day of fire coming. And all throughout the scriptures, God is promising those who will stick here that that day won't burn them up. He promises that that's how it's going to happen. So, anyway, that's, that's the idea, that's the concept. So, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day cometh that shall burn them up. Now, there is a day of fire coming, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Six things here. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try, you see the connection here, that in 1 Peter, shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. And I'm, gonna, I'm just asking you a question. Knowing that we are approaching the day of the Lord, the day of fire, 
What are you spending your time with? What are you building? What are you working on? We've already seen that stubble represents wickedness. We've already also seen that our faith is much more precious than gold. And so there is, a, there is going to be a revealing of fire, a trial by fire. And those who are playing games with God, those who are saying, oh, I'm a Christian. Uh, yeah, I'm going to church. Yeah, boy, we went to the Youth with a Mission conference. Boy, that music was awesome. Woo! Okay? It's not really for me to judge everybody. Ah, they're not saved. Ah, they're not. That's not my place. But I can see people building houses and building their lives and their works out of stubble. And I'm just going, boy, if a fire hits, they don't stand a chance. So we warn people. We try to reach people with the truth. Because that day is coming where all of our works, mine included, are going to be tried by fire. It's going to happen. The day of fire, the fiery trial. Now, I mentioned, this. we're going to go back to this word here, and we'll say it again. Kindle. What's the first thing that pops in your mind? Okay, let's read the verse. Obadiah 118, the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them, in them, it's in them, and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. If that is what you were thinking of, the kindle. Now, I remember several years ago when this is an Amazon.com product, when Amazon.com first came out with the Kindle. I mean, it was just, it sort of led to the tablet revolution. Okay? And I'm not saying that owning a tablet's going to make you go to hell. Obviously, I wouldn't say that. Okay? In fact, the Bible says make it plain upon tables. That's what this is. It's a table. It's a tablet. That's why they call it that. Okay? So anyway, but when the t Kindle comes out, Amazon.com, what they want to do is they want to sell books. They want to sell a lot of books. So they started this several years ago, converting all these books into electronic format. So people now, you see them everywhere. I mean, this is like 2006, 2008, 2000, somewhere around in there. Now everybody, not everybody, but you see people everywhere sitting around reading these things holding these things in their hand or whatever. And what they're doing is that they're reading. What are they reading? Well, you know, some people read the Word of God. Awesome. I think that's absolutely great that we have the technology now to read the Word of God anywhere we go. You remember, they gave the term Great Bible to this Bible that was published in England. You know why? Because it was huge. It was massive, man. Nobody could carry this Bible around. Well, now we can. Now we can carry, we got it on our phones, our tablets, everywhere. We can carry the Word of God, God around with us everywhere we go. We can pull scriptures up. We can do searches. Things that the Bereans did in the book of Acts, but it took them days to go through the scriptures. Now we can just pull up a word and say, look here, look what the Bible says here. This is what I do. This is what I'm doing now as I'm showing you what stubble is in the Bible. How, how, how do I know this? That I go through every page of the King James Bible, 1189 chapters, and find every... No. I pulled it up on my tablet and looked it up. We actually had a lady write software for us. PureBibleSearch.com. Free software. Download it. You can search the King James. You can find out what's Kindle, what's stubbled, what is Kindle, what's stubble, what has sparks what the flame is. This is what we're doing. But probably 99.9% .9 of the people who have a Kindle or a tablet, they're not reading the Bible. What are they reading? Quantum spirituality. The lost symbol. Which actually, we're going to deal with this. The lost symbol. All these other books, actually you can get from uh, iBooks, Morals and Dogma for free. I think it's a free download. They're reading novels and fictions and philosophical books. And what's happening is, is that they're learning ideas and philosophies and doctrines 
that are contrary to the word of God. So do you see what's happening here? The Kindle, go back to this graphic here, the Kindle, fire, these, all the reading of these books and the introduction of these new doctrines, it's kindling a fire. It's doing something with the divine spark that's in people. And see, the whole idea of the divine spark, we'll talk about this more later, but the whole idea of a divine spark is that it's there, and it's just barely there, okay? But it needs something to bring it to a full flame of divinity. It needs to be kindled. You see, when I was growing up, we had, uh, my dad put in a fireplace in our home, just a little single wide trailer is what, what I grew up in. But he built a fireplace in there, and then later on, uh, put a wood stove in. And so, I was get wood, okay, that's who I was. And I knew, I learned how to start a fire in a fireplace. You can't take these big massive chunks of wood. You take little bitty strips of wood, small pieces. Very, very tiny, dry wood. That's called kindling. Learn that word. We have to kindle the fire first. Then we can really get it to burn. And see what's happening is that the introduction of all these ideas and doctrines, philosophies that are contrary to the Word of God, this is the wine that will inflame the hearts of men and kindle the divine spark inside of them. Do you see where we're going here? I came upon this graphic when I was looking for graphics to use for the Kindle fire. Um, and I, I thought it was the symbol for Kindle itself, but I actually did take a look at it. This is uh, the Kindle Fire, uh, and you see Sencha, the HTML5 scorecard. Now, some of you are going, oh, yeah, I know what that is, okay? I kind of know what it is. What it is is that this company, Sencha, they have a framework for developers to write apps for Android, which is what Kindle is using now. They're using the Android uh uh, operating system, which is a, a branch of Linux, um, um, or it's the, like the Windows is using Windows OS for tablets or, or phones, uh, or Mac, this is iOS, this is owned by Apple. So what Sencha does is that they have a, a, a framework whereby developers can write applications for these tablets. In other words, they, 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 built, this little, they built this little module if, if I had an idea for an app, I could use the Sencha Foundation, and, and d they did all the hard work. All I have to do is add in the decorations. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? That's kind of how I understand it. It may be wrong, but that's kind of how I understand it. Here's the thing. Their choice of logos, and Sencha, are, you see the Sencha architect there? Okay? Uh, very interesting. Bill Gates decided he doesn't want to run the whole thing of Microsoft anymore. So he bows out, he sits on the sidelines, and he's called now the chief architect. Masonry has a god that they serve. If you've ever seen The Matrix, hello Neo, I'm the architect. I invented The Matrix. The great architect of the universe is none other than Lucifer himself. You know, the dragon that's on fire, got fire coming out of his mouth. We're going to see that in a little bit. Okay? So it's the, it's the architect architecture that you write all these apps with. And I was looking at their symbol, and, and it dawned on me what that was. I have seen this. Now, if you look at it, let's, we just keep it simple. It sort of looks like a stylized S. Okay, I get that. But you also see, those of you who sort of recognize a little bit about symbolism, you see the as above, so below, something pointing up and something pointing down. As it was in the days of Noah, you know that the, the flood waters came up from the ground, they came down from the sky. So shall it be in the last days, because the armies, the invaders, the fourth king was going to come up from the ground, the pit, they're going to fall down from the sky. So that's sort of the idea of what that is. But what that really is, it's a Hebrew letter. It's the Hebrew letter Yod. It's where in the King James where Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. The, the, the word jot is the Latin 
Grecianized form of the Hebrew letter Yod. Okay, Jod or Yod and Jot, pretty much the same thing. All right, it's the Hebrew letter Yod, and you you see it here inside of an upside down triangle. Let me show you what that symbol means. We're going to pull out morals and dogma here. Albert Pike knew the power of the symbol of the yod. And you go back to the Kindle Fire thing, the sentia, that is their symbol. So Albert Pike says in Morals and Dogma, in the east of the lodge, over the master, enclosed in a triangle, is the Hebrew letter yod. In the English and American lodges, the letter G is substituted for this. Yod is in the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, the symbol of unity of the supreme deity, the first letter of the holy name, and also a symbol of the great Kabbalistic triads. To understand its mystic meaning, you must open the pages of the Zohar and other Kabbalistic books and ponder deeply on their meaning. It must suffice to say that it is the creative energy of the deity, is represented as a point, and that point in the center of the circle of immensity, it is to us in this degree the symbol of the unmanifested deity, the absolute who has no name. Stop, 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 Ready? God, God, got to talk about this. Because in Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol, the lost symbol was the circumpunct, the point within the circle. And that's what Pike is talking about here. We're going to explore that as we move along and what the symbolism is of the point within the circle. I used to make fun of that. So that's nothing. That's like some guy going, see that? That's Mason symbol. It's at the period of all your sentences, Hoggard. Therefore, you're a Mason. <laughs> uh, no. Anyway. Uh, the point within the circle. It actually has a very deep, hidden, occult meaning. What does it represent? We're going to talk about that. But he talks about the Yod. Now, he said, now in American lodges, you have a triangle. You have the letter G in it. They took the Yod out. In French and British and other Masonic organizations across the world, they have a triangle with the Hebrew letter Yod in it. He said it represents... Um, it represents the creative energy of the deity, the unmanifested deity. You know, that in itself right there should tell you that the God of masonry who is unmanifested is not the God of the Bible. Because Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto us uh, by, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God is manifested through his Son. So the God, the real God of the Bible is not the unmanifested God. Who, who is it? It's the one that's hidden like a spark. And the Yod symbol, and here, here's what he was getting at a while ago. He's talking about the deity, the, the first letter of the deity. Follow with me. Yod, hey. Va, hey. How many letters? One, two, three, four. We're actually going to see, not in this part of the series, later on when we deal with like elemental witchcraft and things like that, the earth, fair, earth air, fire, and water, the tetragrammaton, sacred name. Actually, they say by saying this name the right way with the four letters, you're going to invoke the creative energies of the God whose name that is. That's witchcraft. We'll get into that a little bit later on. But the Yod is that symbol of that unmanifested deity, the absolute who has no name. So just kind of ponder that. Here it is. Here's what it looks like in masonry. You see the symbol. Let me go back to the Kindle Fire logo. Look, take a look at it there. Take a look at it here, this fire, this, uh, this yod in the triangle. And then look at this one here. Here's a Masonic ring, Masonic emblem. It is the yod. It kind of has various forms, but look on this Masonic ring, that yod in the center of the triangle. Now I want you to think about that. What, what does a triangle look like? What does fire look like? All right? So you have this yod symbol in the middle of that triangle. And we're finding out, we're going to find out what that yod represents and how it's related to the power of the flame. By the way, anybody comes in your church, uh, some guy, and they've got a ring on, they've got a little triangle with that little symbol in it. 
just telling you who they are, okay? Now, uh, secret teachings of all ages. Manly Hall. Here's what Manly Hall said about the Yod. In modern masonry, the deity is symbolized by an equilateral triangle. It's three sides representing the primary manifestations of the Eternal One, who is himself represented as a tiny flame called by the Hebrews Yod. So the Yod symbol, you go back to the um, Kindle thing, Kindle fire and the Sencha symbol, they're basically speaking the same thing because it represents a tiny flame, a spark of divinity. That's the first letter of the Tetragrammaton. They say that when you speak the other letters and let them, then that's going to build the, it's going to kindle the fire. You see the connection now? Um, Yod says the Sifra de Zinyutha is the symbol of wisdom and of the Father. Stop right here. The Yod is the symbol of wisdom. Ezekiel described Lucifer, the anointed cherub, as being wiser than Daniel and no angel, nothing surpassed his wisdom. You would look at that and say, well, it's wisdom, it's God, and it's the symbol of the Father. Well, that would be, that would be God. Not so fast. Let's look at the scriptures. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Then look at John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So what is this yod? It is a symbol of the father. What father? Not this one. The father of the Book of Mormon. It's a lie. There's no truth inside of this. Um, morals and dogma. These false Bibles that took out God's name, Jehovah, took it out. Okay? They replaced it. And then they took hell out 22 times and replaced it with something that you probably never heard of. Sheol or Hades. Where is that? They took it out. No truth in that. Um, the Aquarian Conspiracy, all these books, the devil is the father of these books. They came out of his mouth. Meanwhile, here is thy word is truth, is what Jesus said. So, you, people call themselves Christians. They say, oh, I'm, a, I'm just good at Christians that anybody is. I, I just don't, you know, this and that and the other. You have to ask yourself who your father is. Because if your faith and your religion and your ideas are based upon things that are not true. Where is your faith? See, we're saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. And so, what, what does that say about whose people's faith? He, Jesus looked right at the Pharisees, the Jews, and he said, you're of your father, the devil. You go around telling lies and spreading all these lies everywhere. That's who your daddy is. I'm telling God's people, who have their father, God is their father, they may not like it, but they tell the truth, and they love the truth. That's what they do. Here's another quote from Manly Hall. Yod, the germ, the life, the flame, the cause, the one. Stop! Stop! Stop right here. I just see something I have, I have not seen up until now. You know, I put all this stuff together and some of it doesn't hit me for a while. In Revelation 13, I just saw this. Revelation 13. Uh, here's the false prophet. Verse 16. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The yod is the germ. You know what that term means? Seed. When you germinate something, you're planting seed in it. When a seed is germinated, that means it's going gonna, it's gonna to give life. The yod is the divine spark. It's the germ, the life, the flame, the cause. What is it 
that the false prophet is going to use to cause everybody to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. All of these little kindle objects that's going to kindle the, the divine flame and cause everyone to receive a mark. Anybody who's taught you that, and, and I used to follow this stuff too, you know, the, the, uh, the Left Behind series, and before that they made some movies back in the 70s, A Thief in the Night, and it showed people being drugged, kicking and screaming and getting the tattoo on their forehead, the barcode and all that stuff. That's not what the Bible says. No one, no one is forced. No one is forced. They chose. They chose. And the false prophet is going to use the cause to cause people to receive the mark. Yod, the germ, the life, the flame, the cause, the one, and the most fundamental of the Jewish phallic emblems. If you don't know what that is, that is a, uh, a guy's junk. That's what it is. Its numerical value is 10, and it is to be considered as the one containing the 10. In the Kabbalah, it is declared that the Yod is in reality three Yods, of which the first is the beginning, the second is the center, and the third is the end. Its throne is the Sephirah Chokma, according to Ibn Geberal Kether, from which it goes forth to impregnate Benah. Did you get that? Yod is the male member. And in the Kabbalah, the Tree of Life, I'm going to show you this a little bit later on. In the Kabbalah Tree of Life, you have, you have three pillars in the Tree of Life. One of them represents um, the male, Yahweh. The other one represents, and I said Yahweh, um, Yahweh is not Jehovah. King James gets it right. It's Jehovah. The, the other one on the other side is the woman, Shekinah. So the Yod impregnates Bina or Shekinah. So what happens? You have this, you have the tree of life, you have this on this side, this on this side, and they're opposite. So that would be like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he impregnates her to have the center pole, which is what they, the Jews call the tree of life. That's the Antichrist. Okay? That's the full flame that by this guy impregnating this girl, a divine spark turns into a flame. In the Da Vinci Code, the first place I really started understanding this, if you remember from the Da Vinci Code, uh, the Grand Master of the Pri Priory of Zion, his granddaughter, or this, the one he was protecting, little Sophie, she got mad at him because she caught him in a ritual where these people had all these masks on and they were man and woman doing it right there and it so disgusted her she ran away okay wouldn't have anything to do with him ever again she thought he was some but they they characterized it in the da vinci code as this is what this is the the worship of the sacred feminine and the divine within all of us and this is the sacred spark that comes into full flame of divinity how by fornicating that's what they were doing that's what is in the kabbalah the kabbalah teaches that the Yod impregnates the Benah so she can have a baby. Remember, she's conceived chaff and she's going to bring forth stubble. That's what all of this is talking about. And I want you to notice that he says it is, uh, its numer numerical value is 10. In Gematria, Jewish Kabbalah Gematria, they assign a number to all the letters. Yod is the 10th letter. So the, the numerical number in the occult of the, of the letter Yod is the number 10. And I'm going to show you why in a little bit. You might want to jump ahead and see, what's that fourth kingdom got? There's a reason why. Um, in the Kabbalah, they take the letters of the yod He vah He. They make them magical. Notice that on the top here, you have the Yod, and it has a crown on it. Think of Revelation 9, 11. They had a king over them. They had a crown. They had a king over them. It was the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, going back to morals and dogma, here's what Albert Pike said about the yod and the impregnation. The yod impregnates the letter He and begets a son. And she, thus pregnant, brings forth. 
The principle called father, the male or generative principle, is comprehended in Yod, which itself flows downward from the energy of the Absolute Holy One. Yod is the beginning and the end of all things that are. The beginning and the end. So, this Antichrist, Yod, this little divine spark, pretends to be who? Jesus, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm going to throw something else in here. It dawned on me, see all these people, Hebrew roots and sacred neighbors, telling everybody, oh no, you've got to go to the original Hebrew. His, his name is not this Greco-Pagan Roman Jesus, hey Zeus, you're worshiping the god Zeus. That's what they're trying to con everybody into believing. That all of the Bible, including the New Testament, was originally written in Hebrew, and the pagans got a hold of it and ruined it, wrote it in Greek, even though there are no Hebrew original manuscripts of the New Testament floating around. They don't exist. Anyway, so they're trying to tell you that what Jesus said, and it, it, it had dawned on me, if, if the whole New Testament was written in Hebrew and, and Jesus actually identifies with the Hebrew only, why did Jesus identify himself to John as the Alpha and the Omega? Not the first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. So then 119 Ministries, and there are several others now that are doing this, they're trying to teach you that what that really would, what Jesus being a Jew and John being a Jew, what he really would have said is, I am the Aleph Tav, not the Alpha and the Omega. Even though that's what's written in all the Bibles, including all the Greek manuscripts, they say what Jesus really would have said in the original Hebrew is Aleph Tav, but that's not what he said. So watch out for the leaven of these pharisaical Hebrew roots people and sacred name cult people who are trying to bring you back in. To see, when, you know what the root of Hebrew roots is? The Kabbalah. And I'm going to prove it to you in this teaching. I may not get to it today, but I'm going to prove that to you in this teaching. That the roots of Jim Staley's Hebrew roots and 119 Ministries roots and Monte Judah's roots and all these other guys, the root of that is the Kabbalah. That's what they're trying to get you into. Stay away from it. It's dangerous. It is full of lies that have nothing but to try to bring a cause in your life for you to receive a mark. Stay away from it. Here is a list of the Hebrew alphabet, or Aleph Beth. You see Aleph Beth, Gimel, Daleth, He, Vau, Zayin, Chef, Teth. And then you have Yod. Now remember in Gematria, by the way, let me stop right here. I learned this the other day. I've got it in my notes. I'm going to bring it out somehow, some way. In the Hebrew Kabbalah, they're very, very reliant upon gematria. They read the Hebrew Old Testament. It says one thing. But then they can make the, the Hebrew scholars, the, the rabbis, that all these Hebrew roots people sit and learn from. They have this idea in Gematria. Staley teaches this and others. They teach that these letters have magical numerical values. Here's what I learned the other day. That the Hebrew word for, I think it's the serpent, Nahash, has the, it's, if you add up the numbers of the Hebrew letters, it's like 358. This guy was teaching, and he said, if you take the numerical value of Nahash, the serpent, you take the numerical value of the Hebrew word for Messiah, it also is 358. And the guy was saying, and people were going, oh, wow, a revelation. Ooh, the Messiah. He was teaching that the serpent's really the good guy. He was teaching in Genesis, out of Genesis 2, that God actually wanted everybody dead. And it was the serpent who promised life. See, it's a setup. All of that gematria stuff where these letters have numbers which you don't see in the Bible. You don't see in the Bible that Hebrew letters or even Greek letters or English letters, for that matter, have numbers attached to them. You don't see it. It's not there. It doesn't exist. So when someone brings that to you, it's a setup. It's part of the cause I'm trying to convince you that the Mashiach and the serpent are the same. You think about it. It's dangerous. Okay? 
But you, you see that Yod is number 10. Now here's why. First of all, let's look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Then in Numbers 21, 8, the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Now why am I putting these verses in? I'm going to show you something. The serpent in Revelation 12, the dragon, he's a red dragon. What color is fire? Red. The serpent that appeared to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, Numbers 21 tells us that he is a fiery serpent. There are other places in the Bible that refer to uh, the fiery flying serpents and so on. So the serpent of the Garden of Eden and the dragon of Revelation 12 and Numbers 21, they all represent fire. It is a fiery serpent. So now watch this. That serpent is the anointed cherub that covereth. So Yod being its numerical value being number 10, I'm going to show you something from Ezekiel 28 and his description of the, the red dragon, the anointed cherub, the fiery serpent, Lucifer, the devil himself. Notice how the Bible describes him. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Count with me. The sardius, number one. Topaz, two. Three, the diamond. Four, the barrel. Five, the onyx. Six, the jasper. Seven, the sapphire. Eight, the emerald. Nine, the carbuncle. Ten, gold. Notice that the serpent the fiery serpent, the devil, has ten stones of fire built into his body. That's what he represents. He represents... So think about it. Think about the fourth kingdom. Where does it embed itself? Into the toes. How many of them are there? Ten toes. Ten represents dominion. So the devil, the anointed cherub, with the ten stones in his, in his body, that's how he was decked, that's how he was adorned. He has that number in him. It represents, he is the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Remember when this serpent with the ten stones stood with Jesus and said, see all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you. And Jesus never said, you don't own them. What do you mean give them to me? They're not yours. Jesus didn't say that, didn't argue with him. Those kingdoms, now the devil is gaining dominion and will in the last days have dominion over all things in this earth. He is as much part of this fourth kingdom as anybody else is. So the yod, being a symbol of the flame, being a value of the number 10, does not represent this God here. It represents this God over here. Now, think of what a serpent, what is the most notable thing of a serpent? What is it that they do? How do, how do serpents smell around them? Okay? They stick their tongue out. The most notable thing of a, of a serpent among the fangs and the scales and blah, is the tongue. Notice what the Bible says about the tongue of the serpent. Job 20 verse 16, he shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. Now I want to stop right here. Think about what the devil did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He spoke. He used, see the word tongue in the Bible is always interchanged and part of this idea of language. Every nation and tongue. The gift of tongues. We're going to look at that. The gift of tongues. Tongues were cloven fire. I'll show you, I'll show you something neat here in a little bit. So the tongue represents words or speech. Go back to Job 20.16. He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. What is it? that? What did the devil do? He brought death to Eve and to Adam by means of the poison that was in his tongue. His words. So, you want to be a good Christian. And you're reading the King James. 
And the Mormons come by you and said, we have a new book written by the angel Moron, I, and we're going to add this to the Word of God. Now read this. This is the serpent's poison. And people who follow this bring death upon themselves. They're promised life, like the devil promised life in, in, in Eden, but it actually brings death. Now let's move on. James chapter 3, verse 5. So we know the tongue associated with speech and the viper's tongue kills people. Notice James chapter 3, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. So is the Antichrist, by the way, the beast. He boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea, four things here, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Think of now what we've learned so far. The Kindle. Why did they call it that? Because they meant, and, and they, they will tell you, we meant to kindle ideas in people's minds. But if those ideas are contrary to the Word of God, they're false. They're the poison of the serpent. He's saying the tongue is a fire. And we're not talking about God's tongue either, God's speech. We're talking about man's speech. Sur surely God's tongue, God's speech, is full of life. You have the words of eternal life, they told Jesus. Meanwhile, the devil, he's speaking death to everybody. And that tongue, the, the transmission of words from people into people's minds, kindles the flame in them. Have you ever been to someone who... Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler could stand in front of people and give a speech and he turned Europe upside down and lit them on fire over, over him. Why? He would deliver these speeches. Herod. What did he do in the book of Acts? He stood there and delivered this speech and they said, that is the voice of God and not a man. You know what Herod was doing? He inflamed those people. He stirred them up. He kindled the spark in them with his words. That's what it's saying here. The tongue, the words of the devil, the dragon, the serpent, they're fire. And once those words get out and go all over the place, they're going to set the whole world on fire. You know what the um, publishing company, the United Pentecostal Church is? The United Pentecostal Church is the church that, number one, denies Father, Word, Holy Ghost. These three are one. They say, that's not true. That's in the Bible. Ah, they added that. Yeah, that's what they did. See, you make it up as you go. And then they say, if you don't speak in unknown gibberish, you are going to hell. You know what their publishing company is called? World of Flame Publishing. And they get it from, apparently, Acts chapter 2, but I would say James chapter 3. They intend on setting the whole world ablaze with unknown tongues. You think about that, okay? Because we're going we're gonna to compare Scripture with Scripture here in a little bit. That symbol I showed you a little while ago with the uh, yod flame inside the triangle, that was in a church. That was in Alpine Lutheran Church. And here's what it says here. Creation is symbolized by the gold triangle and yod within the huge sunburst. The sun is on fire, by the way. The yod is the ancient sign for God the Father. All things that are or will be are expressed by the sunburst. You will note the repetition of the sunburst in the various windows in this series. In other words, this church was decorated with all these occult symbols in their church. Whoever designed this and put this in here, whoever was running this church when these things were put in, knew exactly. They, they knew exactly what they were talking about. When they described the yo as the, the flame, the fire, the creative deity.
They knew exactly what they were dealing with. Okay? Now, watch this. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now, I'm going to, we're going to actually examine scriptures. I know that the Bible says the Lord is a consuming fire. His word is a, is a flame. So I understand that. Okay? But there are people who place, to me, a very heavy influence in the church on this concept of fire and flame. And they keep referring to the fire of the Lord as, oh, we're going to be, we're going to set you on fire. The fire of the Lord is going to come and consume us all. You listen to the words and I'm going, um, I don't know that that's such a good idea. Especially when it specifically says here that the fire of the Lord was because of his anger being kindled against his people who were complaining and rejecting his word. His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and this was not good. This, in fact, this was so bad that Moses and the people begged God to make it stop, and God quenched the fire. You be careful what you're asking for. God, send fire down upon you. Be careful. Be careful what you're asking for. You better know. You better know what this Bible says. Numbers chapter 25, verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. The anger of the Lord was what? Kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And, of course, cursed is anyone who hangs from a tree. Verse 5, Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his, his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. What happened? Oh, God, we want you to kindle a flame in the monks. And God said, okay, because they had joined themselves to Baal, their other Lord. My sweet Lord. That's who, that, that's who Harrison was singing about. They had joined themselves to Baal, and what that did was that kindled. So why is all this stuff coming out? All of these false doctrines, all these heresies, all these ideas that are contrary, these tongues of the serpent that are contrary to the Word of God, they are kindling the wrath of God against mankind. That's what this Bible is telling us. Deuteronomy 32, 22, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and can, shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of of the mountains. Joshua 23, 16. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Second Kings 22, 13. Go ye inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all which is written concerning us. See, what happens when you reject the word of God and you go for all this other stuff, you kindle the wrath of God on you. The kindling is being added right now. How did the old timer, how did them old timers start a fire? Okay? They found out that flint would actually create a spark. That when the spark landed in the dry tinder, the kindling, they could get a flame out of it. That's that same concept. All of this is just dry stubble. It's not, it's not a lot. You know what stubble is? It's like dead, dead parts of like grass or things like that. All of this is just dry stubble, and it's going to kindle the flame of the Antichrist. Maybe soon. We're working up to it right now. Jeremiah 7, 18, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire. 
The women need their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, that's the Virgin Mary, <laughs> and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. He said in 21.14, But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, saith the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. I will kindle a fire in the forest. And he, notice that he said the fruit of your doings. What did Adam and Eve eat? They ate the fruit of their doings. There's, there is a fire being conceived right now. And it's going to rise up to a full flame. And that is going to be the fruit. Of their, see, the fire is the fruit of the spark. The spark hits the kindling. The spark, you can say, is like the masculine. Kindling is all these thoughts and ideas in humanity. And what happened? We gave birth to a fire. And God associated it with his wrath. Jeremiah 43, 12. I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captives. And he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd putteth on his garment. And he shall go forth from thence in peace. Ezekiel 20, 47. Look at this. And say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle the fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree. He's going to kindle a fire in thee. And he said, The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. Let me show you what that looks like. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. We used that exact same idea. Notice the flame in the face, the forehead, where the mark is. That right there is the mark of the beast. By the way, I don't know why Buddha's head looks like the top or the bottom of an acorn. But it does. Have you ever seen an acorn? You know what it looks like, all right? But it kindles a flame. The kindling is going to take place, and where's the mind? It's right here. The fire is going to be ignited right here in the minds of men. The great cause, the yod, the tiny flame, is going to bring people to set themselves on fire and take the mark of the beast. Their God is the God of fire. That's what they worship Him. Now, I'm going to kind of wrap this up here with this idea. So, uh, and I don't want to breed any confusion because God said, "Is not my word as a fire." We're going to talk, and we're going to show you the difference here. There are, just like there are, uh, there's two, there's two. Um, I was going to say wolves. There's two lions in the Bible: the lion of the tribe of Judah, Christ; the roaring lion, Satan. All right. Two lambs in the Bible. Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there is the beast like a lamb, the false prophet, who causes everybody to get into the man of sin. See the opposites here. So now we're looking at two flames. One is the Word of God. The other is the judgment of God to mankind. So let's look at it. Luke 12, 20, 49. This is what Jesus said. He said, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it already be kindled? You get it? You, you understand now what he's saying. Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say he saith. Did you see that? Did you see this? This King James Bible is so amazing that it's just like, you're, you're, you're going, what in the world's a divine spark? You know, I was watching Bruce Almighty, and he's talking about, and we're going to talk about that. We are talking about divine spark. What is that? Read King James. He'll tell you what it is. He'll tell you what, he'll tell you what all this stuff. He'll tell you what Benny Hinn's fire anointing is all about. It's right here. And look at what he said. He said, I am, Jesus himself said, I am come to send fire on the earth. How? Jesus is the Word of God. Is not my word like as a fire. Jesus said, I'm come to send fire on the earth. That fire is a fire of judgment. But it represents His Word. Those who accept and follow His Word have a lamp under their feet and a light under their path. You see, because light in our universe comes from fire of some kind. The sun, it's on fire. Candles, on fire. Coal oil, coal oil lanterns, on fire. Flashlights. Thomas Edison figured out a way in a, in a light bulb 
to make this little this little thing inside there glow and burn without being burned up. He just simply took all the air out of it. But it's still at its core a fire. So the Word of God being a fire to us, it's not a fire that devours us. It's a fire that lights our path. This is darkness. But it's a fire that consumes. And look what he said. It's not my word like a fire. And he said, I'm going to set on fire all of those prophets that steal my words away. That's what they did. And use their tongues. And saith, God says, Oh, God, God told me not to read the King James anymore. See how it works? Man, this Bible's right. So now we go back to James 3. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So when they use their tongues, they are actually bringing the fire of God. They're going to kindle the wrath of God. And God, I hope you're following me here. They're using the words of their mouth and their tongues to kindle the wrath of Almighty God and consume all of mankind. God sent His Word, Jesus, which is a lamp. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He's called Malachi, the Son, S-U-N, capital S-U-N of righteousness. What is the Son? It's on fire. Jesus is the light that shines on our path. Now, so here's what I want you to understand. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Remember, he, he mentioned back here in, um, in um, Jeremiah 23 that use their tongues, all right? And that tongue is a tongue of confusion. It is unknown tongues, words that are said that no one can understand. Why? Because these angels that come are a nation whose tongue you shall not understand. What is it? There's a picture of that in the scriptures. It's called the Tower of Babel. What, how did God judge the world at the Tower of Babel? He confused their tongues. Now these all speak to each other languages that they cannot understand between one another. It's indicative of the fourth kingdom that comes whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Stand. Uh, what I have in my mind right now is Steven Spielberg's movie, um, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The aliens didn't just come down and say, Hola, yo hablo espanol, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Anybody here speak English? It's because they knew they had a language that they wouldn't understand. So they were speaking in the language of symbols. Da, 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 something like that, I don't remember. Speaking the language of symbols. That's what all this is all about. But anyway, let me get to this, and I'm going to close it out here for today. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Notice carefully what the Word of God says. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And notice Psalm 29, 7. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of the fire. Did you see that? I like this. I like this. What was over the heads of those who were speaking? They were not preaching just the philosophies of men in vain deceit, were they? Peter got up and was quoting Joel. How is he doing it? Peter was speaking a non-Hebrew language. So the cloven tongues, and cloven is something that is divided. My Bible is divided, Old Testament, New Testament. Cloven tongues represent something that the tongue of fire that is divided. That's Jesus that represents his first coming because he came made under the law. He came... Uh, when, and sin was added to him. The second time he comes, that's the other part of the fire, he comes as a consuming fire without sin to destroy and bring the wrath of God down upon the earth. 
That's what that symbol over the heads of the apostles represents. It is the exact opposite of what you see in the book of James and the, and the tongue being a flame in a world of iniquity. That flame, these tongues, destroy the world. This light, this fire, gives light unto men so that they can see the path and find their way to heaven. I hope that makes sense to you. And the voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. So he's rightly divided the word of God and one represents his first coming, one represents his second coming. And what happened on Pentecost, you got to love this. On the day of Pentecost, God actually reversed for those who'll trust God. He reversed the curse of Babylon. Because at the Tower of Babel, no one can understand. And now, on the day of Pentecost, when he gives them the tongues of fire, the cloven tongues of fire, the rightly divided tongues of fire, when he gives them that, now it's a lamp and a light. What did Paul see on the road to Damascus? Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, shining down upon his life. It was a light to his path and a lamp to his feet. So, and I hope you're following me on this, because here, here let me make it real simple. The Word of God is a flame that lights our path and gives us light, okay, and warms us a little bit, all right? And yeah, it'll consume the chaff off of our life. These tongues over here are bad, evil. They're wicked, unruly, you can't tame them. And for most of the stuff, like morals and dogma, if you don't know what this Bible says and how this Bible unlocks the secret, you can read 800 some odd pages of Morals and Dogma and go, I don't have a clue what that's talking about. You'll never get it. You'll never understand it. Okay? That's Babel right there. And actually, Albert Pike talks about the core of Masonry being founded at the Tower of Babel because they built with bricks. What do Masons do? Anyway, and it represents the, na the language of symbols that this is the language of symbols is their effort at going against the curse that God did at Babel whereas the Word of God translated into English I love it reverses the curse of the Tower of Babel for us that's why it was shown to be cloven tongues he come the first time He's coming the second time. I want you to think of this, and we're going to close with this. We're going to get into the divine spark next week. And I want you to think of this as we, in preparation to study this. Study all these. Study sparks in the Bible. Study kindles, study flames, fires, things that catch on fire. Study kindlings, all this stuff. Study these things in the Word of God. And I want you to think about what John foretold of Jesus. He said, Jesus has come to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus came, he said, I baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. Where was the fire? It's coming. Are you ready? All right, because what, what led up to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fire was the falling away. They were standing out in the plain of Dura, looking around at everybody else who had fallen. Think of 2 Thessalonians 2. i, I got to quit, but just think about these concepts in preparation for what we're going to learn. We're going to look at this divine spark. We're going to see it in the Bible. Your jaw is going to drop when you see how right this Bible is and how it's telling you what's going on in these last days. And. Maybe you have this concept that Christ is going to translate his church before anything happens. If you get that from the King James Bible, I don't want to be your enemy. And if you don't like me saying otherwise, please forgive me. I mean seriously, please forgive me. I'm trying to follow the scriptures and I think it would be a good idea to prepare ourselves and arm ourselves for the possibility that we will be tried by fire before that day comes. Will you think about that? This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. Thank you for listening today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.